Good morning, everyone. Hopefully, all of you um, get a bulletin from June when you come in. Uh, June has a very important ministry to greet everybody and give a bulletin. And in the bulletins, there's a little place that I don't know if you've noticed before, but it has birthdays. And we always like to, you know, celebrate people's birthdays, but sometimes there's just a need to, you know, bring one up and maybe highlight it a little bit, especially someone who's a little bit behind the scenes and you don't <laughs> John's got a birthday. John Hart's got a birthday coming up this week. Yeah. And if I'm remembering correctly, you're doing communion today, aren't you? Yeah. So when John's coming up for communion, just everybody wish him a happy birthday as he's walking up. Okay. We are so glad that you're here to worship this morning. So let's go ahead and get to it.
Amen. Good morning. As always, it's great to see everyone here this morning. Y'all look marvelous, simply marvelous. And if you're watching us online, good morning to you, and we're so glad that you're joining us here at Beneva Christian Church. Well, our next song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, holds a special place in Christian worship for its comforting lyrics and just gentle words during times of sorrow. Yet the story of its author, Joseph Scriven, is, well, very less well-known. Joseph was born into a wealthy, devout family in Northern Ireland in 1819, and he completed his education at Trinity in Dublin. Just before Joseph was to marry in 1844, his fiancée, was riding her horse along a river. She was thrown into the river and drowned just before their wedding. Overwhelmed by grief, Scriven left Ireland for Canada and he settled in Ontario. In Canada, he committed his life to God and service. So, at the age of 25, he vowed poverty. He sold all of his belongings and he helped those in need. He preached, and he read the Bible in community gatherings, and he taught school, and he even cut wood for those who couldn't pay. He committed to service so much that it was noted by hymnologist Albert Bailey, who called him the man who saws wood for poor widows and sick people who are unable to pay. A decade later, Joseph fell in love. However, Tragedy struck one more time when Eliza died from pneumonia. Despite those losses, Joseph's faith remained unwavering. And in 1855, Joseph penned a poem titled, What is this friendship for which we long? And he wrote this poem just to comfort his ailing mother. He never intended for this poem to see public eyes. However, someone got a hold of the poem, added music to it, and What a Friend We Have in Jesus was born. It became one of the most beloved hymns worldwide. If you are able, please stand and sing this wonderful song.
be seated. One of the things that happens in worship, especially worship planning, is sometimes you fall into ruts and you fall into habits and you fall into patterns. And every now and then you need to shake those patterns up a little bit. You need to shake those grooves up a little bit so that you can jump out of them. And so today in prayer, we're going to do something a little bit different. Usually there's a theme that we want to pray about, and there's a theme that we're going to pray about this morning. But taking in the context that this is communal prayer, so this is a group of people, a community coming together to pray to God, to beseech God, to lay ourselves down before God, we invite you to participate with us because this ministry has needs. And one of the needs that we have that we're going to pray about this morning is our bookkeeper position. For some of you, you might be aware that June is coming rather quickly. And when June comes rather quickly, not you, June, I know you're here already. So (laughs) the end of June, uh, Maggie is going to not leave us. Some people were confused. She's not leaving us. She's staying here. She's still going to stay and still going to do her thing. She's just no longer going to be working in the office as our bookkeeper. So we have been looking for another bookkeeper. And as of yet, we have hit a dead end. We have not encountered anybody. And I was telling Maggie this week as we were talking about this, I said, you know, I think it's time that we got together as a community and prayed for this. Uh, Prayed for God to lift the person up. Because I personally believe we know who this person is. That person just doesn't know yet (laughs) that they're the person. And it might be someone in the room. It might be someone that we know. You know, so during this time of prayer, we're going to pray specifically for God to fill that ministry, to not replace Maggie, because there's no replacing Maggie, but to open the door for this new person to come into this ministry and be a part of it as being a part-time bookkeeper. So let's join together and let's have a word of prayer. Lord, as we come together in this place to worship, we thank you for life. We thank you for this church. We thank you for this community. We thank you for the ability to be here. And Lord, as we know, we might not think about it, we might not always talk about it, but as we know, there are so many things that go on behind the scenes that make a church run. And one of those things that goes on behind the scenes is the bookkeeping, is someone to pay the bills and keep up with payroll someone to take, make sure supplies are being purchased so that we have toilet paper in the bathrooms and we have communion on Sunday morning. It's important, Lord, to have someone in that ministry, and we want to thank you for Maggie's ministry over these last years. Um, she has been glorious and has been wonderful, and now it's time for us to release her, to release her from this ministry so that she can move on to whatever new ministry you have for her. She can move on to whatever new adventures you have for her. But Lord, that leaves a gap. And so we do have a gap that we're looking to fill. And Lord, we know that you know who is going to fill this position. And so we surrender ourselves to you. We lay ourselves down before you and we say, Lord, reveal that person to us. Maybe even reveal this ministry to that person, whether they're listening to this prayer right now or maybe a conversation we're going to have with someone later. Lord, I pray that you open that door to create that opportunity for someone to come and to serve you in ministry. Not upfront ministry, but behind the scenes. But ministry nonetheless, so important. And so, Lord, we pray for this position to be filled. We pray for your will to be done. We pray for you to guide us into this new chapter that we're going to be experiencing at the end of June and beyond. And so, Lord, we pray for that person. We pray for the person who will be here. We pray for our eyes and ears and hearts to be open to those around us because maybe we know someone that this would be a perfect position for them, that this would be a perfect ministry for them. And Lord, if that's the case, then I pray that you give us the strength to shoulder tap, the strength to invite. Because Lord, may we be reminded that conversations are free. Nobody's on the line. It's just an ability or an opportunity to have a conversation to go a little bit deeper in discernment. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for this ministry. And we thank you for the opportunity to serve. So we ask that you you bless Maggie. You bless Maggie and the the time that she has as the bookkeeper. 
We ask that you bless her as she moves on after June, June 30th, into whatever road you're going to lead her on. But also, too, Lord, we pray for this ministry and that position, that you would open up the door for that person to come and enter and be a part of this ministry, to be a part of this community, maybe in a different way or maybe in a new way. And Lord, uh, we turn to you because we know that you have all of the answers. And we are sorry, Lord, for the times in our life when we don't turn to you. Uh, We feel we need to handle everything on our own. We feel we need to take care of things on our own, and we don't lean into you. And so now, right now, Lord, as a church, we're leaning into you. Leaning into you for this position. Leaning into you for this ministry. So, Lord, uh, we can't wait. We can't wait to see what you do. We can't wait to see what doors are opened, what connections are made, and what relationships are formed. Worthy is the
the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, David, I do control the technology. I can make your week very exciting. Thank you. Um, as David talks about, when he's up here, you get to hear about his stuff. And so I think it's uh, safe to say whenever we have someone talking about communion, you get to hear about their stuff, things that are going on in their lives, things that they're experiencing, things that they may be reflecting on. As many of you know, I'm in seminary, and one of the classes that I'm taking right now is theology and theological language, which I've always kind of known that theology is about understanding the nature of God. I thought it was much more uh, single-dimensional in the sense that it's it was like a practice, kind of like maybe anthropology or something like that, but as you start getting into theology, there's a lot of different practices and perspectives uh, in, in how theologians look at and, and reflect on God's nature. Also, tomorrow is Earth Day, so I thought it was appropriate to kind of tie those two together. I don't know what may be going on in your homes this weekend, but I know in our home we are working on planting and things like that, and so... Earth Day is uh, something that politically we put together uh, and, and put forth back in the 70s, but as we think about the history of it, going back to Genesis, God really looked at, you know, that was one of our first tasks, was to take care of the garden, to take care of the, uh, the creation that, uh, that he, he did for us. So thinking about theology and trying to understand the nature of God, C.S. Lewis is a theologian that lived in the 20th century. And I like a lot of the, the writings by him because it, it simplifies some of the concepts. A lot of theologians are very difficult to kind of follow. But one of the things that he had done in one of his meditations called Meditation in a Tool Shed is he create, uh, critiques the modern way of thinking about the nature of God. He argues that some people believe that the best way to understand the nature of God is to look at things such a, you know, from an outside perspective, perhaps just reading the scripture or uh, looking at the viewpoints of those who, who are looking uh, at what the scripture means. And he suggests that this approach overlooks valuable insights that people of faith themselves can offer. So here's a little excerpt from his essay. I was standing today in a dark tool shed. The sun was shining outside and through the crack at the top of the door, there came a sunbeam. From where I stood, that beam of light with the specks of dust floating in it was the most striking thing in that place. Everything else was almost pitch black. I was seeing the beam, not seeing the things by it. Then I moved so that the beam fell on my eyes. Instantly, the whole previous picture vanished. I saw no tool shed and above all, no beam. Instead, I saw framed in the irregular cranny at the top of the door, green leaves moving on the branches of the trees outside, and beyond that, 90-odd million miles away, the sun. Looking along the beam and looking at the beam are very different perspectives. And theology and the study of religion uh, and, and our faith can be very much like that. One of the things about the Bible is it's not just stories of people 
in history. It's stories of God relating to those people. God's revealing God's true nature to the people through those stories. It's not just about uh, a man who was in Galilee and, and taught people the, the value and importance of caring for and loving their neighbors. It was Christ coming into humanity and showing us. We have that opportunity, whether we want to just look at the scripture or look at it from a different perspective and be embodiments of what Christ has called us to do. Communion is very much that same thing. The way we practice communion is with an open table. We practice an open table. The reasons why is we, because, we believe it's because Christ's grace is available and open to all. And that's the way Christ gave his life. It wasn't for the Jews. It was for all humanity. There's a scripture in Romans that speaks of salvation. And this was something that I had studied in last month's class, which was on some of the Pauline letters. It's not through our faith that we're saved. It's through the faithfulness of Christ. We are very finite beings. We are very limited in our scope and our understanding. Our faith, our, our trust in, in God, our trust in each other, our ability to do good is fractured. It's never going to be adequate. It's through the completeness, the wholeness, the, the faithfulness of Christ that we're saved. It's because of God's faithfulness to us, to humanity, that we have salvation, because we can't do it on our own. On the last night, when Jesus was with his disciples, and he was about to be betrayed, they were sharing in the Passover supper. He took the bread and said, this is my body, which will be broken for you. Take, eat. And do this in remembrance of me. Later that evening, he took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant of my love poured out for the remission of your sins. Drink of this always in remembrance of me. Please join with me in the prayer that Christ taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Those of you who would like to follow along, there are notes in the bulletin. Those of you who are regular here, you'll know that there's always an entry ticket because we're in the midst of a series. The series is based on congregational input, so all of these messages are based on input that you gave me several weeks back when I was walking around with a clipboard looking for suggestions for sermon topics. And so last week we were dealing with the, this a concept that for many of us, like maybe we struggle with a little bit. And that is, is, is that if you accept all of these things as a follower of Jesus, then it must produce behaviors, it must produce life, it must produce decisions. And that's hard for some of us. So before we go into our new topic, we need to be reminded of where we have been. So we have an entry ticket, and the entry ticket that we have for you is the definition of the word kononia. So how many of you can tell me the definition of koinonia based on last week's message? <laughs> Do you know why you can't? I skipped it. I didn't give it to you last week. <laughs> it was one of those things where I was like three quarters of the way through my message. I looked down and I skipped it and I'm like, there's no way I can turn around and get back to it without being extremely clumsy. So I just left it out there. Yes. You know the answer. What's the answer, Jim? 
He's reading off of the, the screen right there. <laughs> See, you needed to get that before because when you leaned over, it kind of gave, gave you away. So the definition of koinonia that we didn't talk about last week was sharing things in common, sharing things in common. And that is a part of our life together as followers of Jesus. We get to share things in common. Good things, bad things, boring things, we get to share in common. So let's go ahead and get to the real entry ticket. The real entry ticket is what does deep-spirited friends mean from last week's message? Deep-spirited friends. Yes? Make everyone know your heart before they know your Yes. Yes. Deep spirited friends means that people know your heart before they know your opinion. And we talked about this last week that in many ways our culture reverses that. You just go ahead and tell everybody what you think before they know who you are. You know, and Many times this causes us to trip up on our relationships. This causes people to trip up in their relationship with God. Um, dare I say, there's probably many people in our world today that don't have a favorable opinion of Jesus because of the Christians they have met. Unfortunately, because those Christians did not reveal their hearts to these people before they shared their opinions. They led with their opinions. And I don't know about you, um, there's a big difference between someone coming into the room and spitting in your face and someone coming into the room and sitting with you and talking with you and sharing their life with you and you sharing their life with them. But many times we kind of operate with, let's just go ahead and spit in people's face immediately. Let's go ahead and go to that place. And so we talked about that last week in this relationship that we have with each other in community. Um, we're called to be deep-spirited friends, people who get very good at allowing people to know our hearts before we ever share with them our opinions about them, the world, or anything else. This week, we're going to be taking a look at the concept of perseverance. Um, perseverance was not a specific request that came down. There was a request of life lessons that someone had given me. So perseverance kind of falls into the life lessons things. There's going to be many things that we're going to be talking about. But this week, we're going to be talking about perseverance. We're going to be looking at James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Um, the picture really has absolutely nothing to do with this, the message, but it's just a really cool picture. If you can notice, it, it's a guy taking a picture of a, a ball that's on, like, a, must be a post on a bridge, and you're seeing his reflection of him taking a picture. And I just thought it was a really cool image, so it doesn't really have anything to do with the message, but maybe you can figure out a way that it connects with the message. That'll be your assignment. That'll be the entry ticket for next week. And how did the picture connect with the message? Let's listen to James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it a sheer joy, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Thanks be to God for the reading of that word. Again, as a little bit of background, this is from the book of James. James was Jesus' brother. And James is an interesting story because James wasn't buying Jesus until after the resurrection. James was, and I think most of us can probably understand this, sibling rivalries and everything like that. Like, sure, you're the savior of the world. <laughs> you know. James wasn't really in the, the trenches with Jesus during his ministry. It was after the resurrection that James was moved by the Holy Spirit, and he made the choice to believe, and he became a leader in the Jerusalem church. And James has a very interesting perspective. Of those of you who have not read James, I invite you to take the time this afternoon, it's not a long book, um, to read through James. Uh, James has a very strong focus on the way that we live our lives as people who are saved, the way that we live our lives as people who follow Jesus, that we're not saved by works, but our works are very important. For faith without works, is a, this is a quote from James, faith without works is dead. And so it's, it's an important kind of tightrope that we walk on all the time. We're not saved by what we do, but because we're saved, it influences what we do. Are you out there? 
Yeah, so we invite you to take a look at James. And when you're reading James, constantly think in the back of your mind, this is Jesus' little brother. So he grew up with him. He was around when Jesus was doing his ministry and all the different thoughts that he had in his mind. So very interesting perspective. So today we're going to be looking at this concept of perseverance. And so I invite you to persevere as we go through this, this passage today. The first thing that I want to take a look at in the notes is trials are inevitable. Trials are inevitable. If you're alive, you're going to experience trials. It's no way to avoid it. Yes, we would like to believe that we could avoid all trials. If I just believe in Jesus and I do all the right things and I'm a good person, then I'll avoid all trials. But we know that's not true. This life will have trials. Trials are a part of our, our lives because they're inevitable. And so this is, this is a message, this is a topic that, that covers all of us because we all experience trials, all experience trials. And trials come at you from all sides. Trials come at you from all sides. And it's important as you're writing those words that you write the words come at you from all sides. Because I don't want you to be confused when James is talking about trials, when we're having this conversation about trials, we're not talking about things that you have caused. There's a big difference between trials and things that you cause. There's a big difference between trials and the things that happen in your life because of the decisions you have made and the steps that you have taken. And this is important for us to delineate because we don't want to read James as a hall pass to say, I can make boneheaded decisions in my life and it's going to strengthen my faith. Mm -mm. No, that's, this is not what James is talking about. James is talking to a community. Remember, he's a leader in the Jerusalem church. Jesus, the leader of this movement, has been crucified by the Roman authorities. And so there is an underpinning in the Jerusalem church of fear, fear of someone being persecuted because of their faith. Many of you have seen the, the, the fish that represents Jesus. Have you seen that before, the Jesus fish? People put it on their cars, T-shirts, and everything like that. Well, the reason why it's a fish is because the early church could not communicate outwardly to each other. You could not wear a T-shirt that said, I love Jesus. You couldn't put a bumper sticker on your car back in that day that's saying, I love Jesus. Because being a follower of Jesus could have put you into some trouble. And so what would happen, like they were out in the marketplace and you, you come across someone and you kind of want, you wonder, like you're having a conversation with him and you kind of wonder whether or not they are a follower of Jesus, you would take a staff or your toe and you would make the symbol of a fish in the dirt. And if that person was a follower of Jesus, they would take their shoe and they would just rub the dirt away, not say anything. And that was your signal to say, you're a follower of Jesus, just like I'm a follower of Jesus. It was a way for them to communicate because they lived in a situation that, dare I say, most of us don't have any understanding about. And that is, my life is threatened. My livelihood is threatened. My family is threatened if anybody finds out that I'm a follower. And so this is the context that James is talking about. James is not saying you can go out there and do whatever you want to do. You can make any decisions you want and damn the consequences because it's going to be okay. Nope, that's not what James is saying. James is saying trials that come at you from all sides. These are things that come at you out of the blue. You're living your life. You're being faithful. You're doing what's right. And all of a sudden you get attacked. You get attacked from outside of you. That's the trials that James is talking about. That's the trials that we have to deal with. Now, I understand this being the nearly perfect church that we might have a hard time understanding what it's like to be living our life and doing our, the, the right thing, keeping our nose clean, and then being attacked out of the blue, not because of something we did, but because of some other kind of agenda that's happening. But there are many people in this world that knows exactly what that's like to be living a faithful life, being a good person, following the rules, you know, being compassionate, being the person that they believe they're being called to be, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they get attacked. 
by coworkers or family or whatever the case may be. They get persecuted. That's what James is talking about. That's the trials that James is talking about. So with that as the perspective, listen to his words again. Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed and not deficient in any way. Not deficient in any way. When we look at that passage with the understanding of what trials means, we look at a Greek term that's called hupomone. Hupomone, Greek hupo means under, and meno means to stay, abide, and remain. So this is to remain under, to remain under. Now, this is an interesting teaching because what is James saying to us if we find ourselves in trials, meaning being persecuted not because of a boneheaded decision we made, but because that we're living our life as a follower of Jesus and we're suffering persecution. What is James' direction to us? What is he saying for us to do? Persevere. Stay there. Stay there. How hard is that? How hard is that? Because our natural tendency as human beings is I want to get out of this. I I want to fix this. I want to make this go away. But James' teaching to us is saying stay there. And we stay there because we're to remain under it. Because as we remain under it, we are strengthened. As we remain under it, we learn and grow. Does this mean we go out and we look for it? No. Because what is inevitable? Trials are inevitable. We've already learned that. First note that you took this morning. Trials are inevitable. So we don't have to go out and look for it. It's coming. And if it's not here already, it's coming. But when it comes, don't try to escape it. Don't try to escape it. Allow yourself to be under it. And that's hard for us. That's hard for us because we want to escape it. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Hupomone, stay under, remain under. And here's the truth. If you get nothing else, hint, 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 entry ticket, entry ticket, entry ticket. Faith is tested through trials, not produced by trials. Faith is tested through trials, not produced by trials. And why is this so significant? Why is this so important? Because if you wait for the trial to come, it's too late. If you wait for the trial to come to build your faith, then you're not going to be able to do it. It's like the same reasoning saying, I will keep a zero balance in my bank account, but I'm still expecting to pay my electric bill. It's not going to happen. So what James is sharing with us in this passage, and he's sharing with the community in Jerusalem, he's saying, build your faith Now, start making deposits into that bank account because there's going to come a time when a trial is going to hit you. Not something that you create, but something that's going to happen to you that's going to come at you. And when it comes at you, you're going to need that faith. You're going to need to be able to make withdrawals. And if you don't have anything in the account, you can't withdraw anything. But sadly, many of us as human beings, we operate in the exact opposite way. Well, I'll wait till the trial comes and then I'll figure out how to be faithful. It's too late at that point. You cannot teach someone how to swim while they're drowning. You just have to rescue them. And so it's important for us to learn, build, and strengthen our faith when the trials aren't coming. Because what did we already learn? Trials are inevitable. And if you're not facing a trial now, start making deposits. Build that faith. Build that faith in your life so when the trial does come, you then have something to withdraw from. Because remember, you can't escape it. You got to stay under it. Because there's going to be strength that's going to come out of it. We can't escape. Um, Butterflies. When they're coming out of the, the, the cocoon, it's very important to allow them to go through that process 
It, I'm assuming it's bad for us to go, and when we see them start to come out, let me help them and just rip the cocoon open so they can come out. And you can't do that. Because the very pressure of coming out of the cocoon is what like, fluffs up their wings and gives them the things that they need. They've got to go through the, the trial of coming out of the cocoon so they could be a butterfly. And it's the same thing for us. We've got to go through our trials so that we can grow. We've got to go through our trials so that we can stand firm on, on the faith. There was a, one time a, a gentleman who was an opera composer, and he wrote this beautiful opera and practiced it and practiced it, and it was opening night. And the lead was a mezzo-soprano, and the mezzo-soprano was a brand-new mezzo-soprano, up-and-coming young mezzo-soprano. And she had an aria in the middle of the opera that was just chilling. And the composer sat in the front row, and he was watching this opera on this opening night, and she was delivering her aria. And after she got done, the person sitting next to him leaned over and said, you must be so proud, because that was so beautiful. And the composer just smiled, and he said, it was. But I can't wait to hear how it sounds when her heart has been broken. We don't like to talk about it, but the rings of our tree is what gives us our personality. The rings of our trees is what makes us us. And we can't escape it. We've got to go through it. We have trials. We need to face them with faith and go through them. And for me, at the end of this message, I think the thing that I want you to remember is don't wait for the trial to come to build your faith. Start now. If your life is good, spend even that much more time building your faith because there's going to come a time when a trial is going to hit you. Not a trial that you've created, a trial that comes at you. And you're going to need something to lean on. Let's join together and have a word of prayer. Lord, it sounds weird to say thank you for trials that come at us. And we don't say thank you because we're like masochists and we want to suffer. We say thank you because that brings our faith to the forefront. When we find ourselves in trials, uh, we see our true colors. We learn and we grow. And so, Lord, I pray for each and every single one of us that right now this would be a time when we would be building, we would be making deposits into our spiritual bank account, that we would be learning and growing so that when those trials come, and they will come, when they come, we'll have something to withdraw, we'll have something to lean on. So, Lord, I pray for each and every single one of us that we would develop perseverance Perseverance in the face of trials because of our faith and perseverance when there are no trials to build our faith. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the words of James that have been preserved for us. We thank you for speaking into our life today. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we have entered that time of the worship service where we have an invitation. An invitation for you to make a decision, for you to take a step. If you're here today and you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then we invite you to take that step, to commit to the relationship, to say, I'm in. It's not about having all the answers. It's not about having everything figured out. It's about you saying, I'm in. And we invite you during this last song to come forward, and we will celebrate with you, and we will pray over you. But maybe you're not the in front of people kind of person that makes you uncomfortable. Well, then we invite you during this last song in that place where you're standing just to close your eyes and just say, Lord, save me. I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus is the Lord and Savior. I believe Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Again, the form is not as important as the function. Take that step and commit to that relationship. But if you're here today and you already have that relationship or you're not quite ready for that relationship, then you need an invitation too. I don't want to exclude anybody. And so I invite you to connect. To connect with someone right after this service. To connect with Zechariah Bible Study on Wednesday night. 
to connect on May 11th when we have our barbecue concert in the park with the, all the families from Little Disciple Preschool. I invite you to connect in some way by helping us to find a new bookkeeper. I invite you to connect in some way, to start to live in your faith, to learn and grow. And if you're here today and you find yourself in a trial, then the invitation for you is to stay under it. Don't try to escape it. Allow it to work in your life. Allow God to meet you in that place and build your faith and build your strength and build your perseverance. Let's stand and sing our last song. you connect, then you're free to go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.